tonight I, uh, I need a couple of volunteers to pass out the program so that you can follow through with it. Who would help me with that? Would, would some of you help us? Okay. That's all right. Okay. It's quick so we can get another person to help and go down and program here that as they're passing it out, I'm going to go through uh, the program itself. World Markets by Al Virgin, uh, Manager of Specialties of I.S. Joseph Company, and his assistant, Marcia Slofelt. And then I'll discuss the Crush Project, something that we discussed just a year ago. Isn't it amazing how time flies? And then after that, say Sutro, and we'll explain that when we get to it. And then there'll be a summary by myself, and then a close, and then there'll be a period for you at that time to ask questions and answers. Well, you won't ask the answers. Uh, uh, we hope we got them ahead of time. Or if not, we can think of one real fast. And then after that, uh, if we aren't fouled up, and we don't think we are, uh, there will be a hospitality time uh, right here with coffee and donuts uh, for your own enjoyment. And at that time, you can meet with the people that are up here on the stage, ask questions, and get acquainted because part of the program today is to get acquainted and know who these people are and have a better understanding, and you'll see as we develop the program today why. But before we get there, let's start off with some of the things that are important uh, uh, for this year. Uh, this year, uh, we anticipated several problems knowing that there would be a dock strike, however, never anticipating that we'd have an independent trucker strike. And even so, we were able to deliver in better order than last year even, uh, more tonnage. To date, we've delivered about 68,500 metric tons in on time. It's quite a record, incidentally, and you're the people who caused it to happen. The next thing that helped this program along is uh, yourselves. And along with yourselves is our staff. And I would like to recognize our staff at this time, we have Warren Double standing up in the back. I'm sure you all know, but Warren, raise your hand. We have uh, Delton Mender. Is uh, Delton in here? Maybe he hasn't made it. He's got an error. I thought he made it. We have Delton Mender. And we also have Bob Lewis. And is Bob in here? There's Bob at the back also. Bob, raise your hand. Uh, that's our three staff in Sunflowers, in addition to Tim Ennis in the home office and uh, someone new that a lot of you people know, Doris McElwain, who is in traffic and, uh, and works that at the home office. Now, to give you an idea how these fellows are doing, they have been averaging for the last 20 out of 22 weeks, 1,000 acres per week sign up. And right now, today, we have 65,000 uh, stand corrected, 62 and a half to 65,000 acres signed up of 1980 flowers compared to about 30,200 acres a year ago this time. So we're progressing in the right direction there. We're ahead of schedule uh, uh, compared to last year, but we're behind schedule because last year we only had 156,000 acres signed up. And I say last year to me, this crop we just delivered was last year. It isn't to you fellows yet, but to me it's last year. And uh, that was 156,000 acres, and that was for fall. We have, in addition to that, of course, about 7,500 acres for the spring block. And this year already we've got 6,200 and some odd acres to start off with already. We hope to have 100,000 by convention, and believe it or not, if those people that have been called on the telephone, and we called everyone that had been signed up before, will return those. We will have over 100,000 right now. We've got that much commitment by telephone. The documents simply haven't been sent back in. If you're one of those that hasn't got that document back into us, please get it in. Uh, the sooner and the faster that we have the acreage, the faster we can do something for you. As an example, in uh, September and even before that, we started selling 1980 crop. Italy in this case, we made uh, approximately, we have made 5,000 tons in contracts already for 1980. Some of it will be going to Italy. 3,000 of those tons is at $11, and 2,000 is at 10.75. Does that sound pretty good today? 
At the time, it didn't sound too good. You know, we thought, well, it ought to be better, and we're very cautious. But it just depends on which end of the telescope you're on. Isn't that right? Well, that's where we stand up to this point. The next thing that you need to know is that uh, starting next week, you'll be getting your uh, final pay price uh, being processed out. We thought we could put it out, and they start processing it while we were here at convention. Uh, we couldn't. We had uh, quite a surprise. Uh, Tim and myself had sold the additional pounds that we thought we had uh, before coming down here. We thought we'd sold enough to cover us until we got back from convention and also to set our final pay price for you for the fall block. We received a call on Monday that we were down here, and over that weekend, uh, we had received right at, as near as we can determine, and they're still trying to uh, pin it down for us, 4,000 metric tons. So you people do know how to deliver. And so we had to sell that, and we had to adjust our pay price. We anticipated that it'll be some, and don't hold me to this, because if you give me some more surprises, you know, then it changed the whole ball game. But right now, as near as we can interpolate, it'll be somewhere around $10.20 to you, even with all this extra that's come in, which I think is just a little bit better than what you're hearing on the outside, plus you've got all those premiums uh, that you can't get anywhere else. I hope that you like that kind of a price and what we've done so far. It's a difficult to outguess you. Last year, uh, we sold and we almost didn't get all of the deliveries, even though we thought we'd only sold 80% of the production. And this year, we had uh, about 11, 12,000 acres more, and we held back for the fact that we didn't feel that we could deliver because of the strike. We knew it was coming and other reasons. We didn't know how you were going to deliver, and so you surprised us the other way. And the unfortunate thing, but the truth is, that those acres out there have a way of fluctuating on their production. And it's very difficult for us to anticipate that. So if there's little variances at times, you want to look around because by averages, we know that there's a lot of people involved in this. And uh, we'll do the best we can, but it's just awful hard to an anticipate. Another example is we had a lot signed up for spring block, and now everyone wants to deliver it in fall, and nobody could anticipate that. But those are things we try to roll with because uh, we try to tailor it for you in that program. As you recall, a year ago, we came out with an idea that we uh, discussed with you that uh, we get involved in, in uh, other types of marketing and sunflowers and go on with that. Uh, had some other ideas. And here we are a year later, and today we're going to find out uh, where we've come from and where we're going. And to start that off, we're going to have uh, a very distinguished gentleman Albert Jean, discuss world markets, and he's going to ask his assistant, Marsha, uh, to assist him in that here in just a moment. But he's going to answer a question I had asked to me just prior to this opening here a few moments ago, is what is the outlook with the acres that we're hearing coming off uh, for world markets next year? What is the outlook as we see it? And Al, as I understand, is going to address himself to that uh, question plus several others. And at this time, I'd like to introduce Albert Jean of the I.S. Joseph Company. He is manager of specialties, uh, grain department for I.S. Joseph. He and I have almost the same title. Been with him quite a while, and a lot of you are personal friends of Al. Al? Thank you, Shelley. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I wonder if you're all aware what an avid deer hunter Shelley is. For the past, I don't know, 15, 20 years now, every fall he's been going up to North Dakota or up to northern Minnesota, and I bet most of you don't even realize that. And uh, it's been getting to his lovely wife, Shirley. Every year he's gone for a week, and she was getting quite disturbed, and she said, Shelly, I'd like to take up that hobby too, deer hunting. It sounds like fun. And he, in his uh, debonair way, kept uh, re rejecting her for years and years. And finally, this last fall, they got together, jumped in the car, put the guns in, and up to northern Minnesota they went. They got to the Bemidji Grand Rapids area. That's along Highway 2 where they all have the Smokies. I'm sure you all picked them up the last two months. <laughs> Shelley found his favorite woods, dropped his wife at the stand, said, no, there's a path, deer comes through here, shoot it. And he proceeded to walk away to his stand about a quarter to a half mile away. Just as he was walking along, bang, bang. He looked back and came from the direction of his wife. He zipped over there and he got where Shirley was, 
there was a man kneeling on the ground like this and surely had a gun at him. And the guy was saying, lady, lady, you can have the animal. I just want the saddle back. So I guess it's duck hunting next year. <laughs> Canvas back. Okay. You're really fortunate to have a quality guy like Shelley as director of your specialty grains department and the quality people that he has working for him. I've known Shelley now for about seven years and considered myself growing a lot personally because of him. I see the rapport that he has with you me members of the National Farmers Organization. I see the respect that has grown over the years between the two of you and the mutual trust and cooperation that has developed. And I really must compliment you on the, it really makes for a successful program. Also, as I've viewed these conventions for about the last four years now, I've noticed the progress and the effectiveness that you have developed in these programs. I know throughout the year here, you had a change of leadership and there might have been some concern. I can honestly say as an outsider, and I hope I'm not an outsider, but a business associate, that the effectiveness has not suffered, but it has improved. You have an extremely well-run show. Normally at this time, I'll philosophize a little bit, go back to past history and relationships between the two companies. I feel that the foundation has been built. We have the fundamentals down, and we can pass on to that part of it and get right to business. So at this point, I'd like to make a note that we are going to divide the program here. We have a new person in our department, new face, Marsha. I will say she's not new to the grain business, so Marsha was born in Montana. She has experience from ranch life. She's worked for a PV company for approximately seven years, starting in Montana, transferred to Minneapolis, where she was a bargainer with all the major grains, wheat, uh, barley, flax, soybeans, whatever. And for the past, past six years has been solely responsible for the development of the sunflower seed program for PV. So we feel we're very fortunate at the IS Joseph Company to have a person from Marsha's experience. She has an acute appreciation of farmers, of country elevator managers, etc., whom she's worked with. And also she's very attractive. And in the trade. <laughs> And in the trade now, they call us the odd couple, Beauty and the Beast. <laughs> so, it's no sense for me, the Beast, to stand up here anymore. Marsha? I don't really know how to start after all that garbage. I don't know. Good. Alan, I split this up, and he's going to talk to you about the export demand, and I thought he was going to do that first, and I was going to talk about the supply. We've just made it through harvest, and we're all taking a sigh of relief. Seems like, uh, hi. <laughs> Seems like every year we have new experiences as we're going through harvest of our crop and this year I think we've seen everything possible that there's to see. Our crops uh, got planted late, we've had uh, strikes, we've had plugged elevators, we've had one thing after another. But all in all it's gone smoothly and we're, we're now breathing a few uh, quick breaths. We're already starting to think about uh, what's going to happen next year and the year after that. There's already new crop bids uh, available for 1980. Um, and that's what I'm going to talk to you about. Most of the people within the business, uh, in, a, in other companies, other traders, we talk back and forth. And everyone is quite uh, concerned about next year. They think that the production of sunflowers is going to be down drastically next year because of the various things that have happened this year late plantings and uh, so on. I don't agree with that. I think that in certain areas the production is going to be down. I think South Dakota for one is going to be down. Uh, South Dakota planted a lot of sunflowers last year because they had winter wheat kill. Excuse me. Excuse me, Marsha. I discovered that we've got 
a fairly large audience outside. We've just made arrangements to move this meeting. Uh, and am I right, start over. <laughs> yeah, you get to start all over. Okay. Am I right? If we move right over, what's the room number? What Russia raises, they consume themselves. They have their own crushing facilities. Uh, they consume it or else they uh, uh, trade it within their own satellite countries. Um, Argentina, which also produces a lot of sunflowers, up until the past two years has produced more sunflowers than the U.S., but we have surpassed them. Argentina has uh, logistical problems in exporting their sun seeds, as well as does Canada. Um, basically, what I want to talk about, though, is our situation here in the U.S. Um, the acreage that we will probably lose next year Will, one will be South Dakota. Uh, South Dakota had uh, winter kill last year, and on the uh, wheat they turned and planted that into sunflowers. Hopefully that won't happen this year, and they are planning to raise wheat from the people that I've talked to down there. Acreage will probably be down in South Dakota. The valley in North Dakota will probably also lose acreage, and the reason is that the valley has been raising sunflowers for the past 10 years, and they're running out of land. Uh, they've had uh, uh, what you have to rotate sunflowers uh, every three years, is that correct? And <clears throat> the undeveloped areas, primarily our seeds are located in uh, North Dakota. They're the northern part, the southern part, and the western part are very undeveloped areas yet. And that's where I think that the heavy concentration of, of new ground is going to be for sunflowers. I say this for one reason, that one is that uh, there is no set-aside program this year. And in North Dakota alone, there's 1,727,000 acres of set-aside land. Now, this set-aside land, it has, you have two options with it. You can let it sit idle with no compensation, or you can plant it into a commodity. Uh, being from a farm background, uh, I know that that land will probably be planted. And a lot of the set-aside land, not all, but especially in the western, bigger counties in the western part of the state, the set-aside land was poor quality land. That will probably go into sunflowers. Now, I don't think all million seven acres, of course, will go into sun seeds, but I think that a great percentage of that area will go into seeds. Another one is the south. I just read an interesting article in the Sunflower Magazine, and they were talking about the seeds down south, uh, Florida, Mississippi, North Carolina, South Carolina, and they've been raising seeds for several years now. They've got problems down there. They have problems with <clears throat> insects and disease. And the biggest problem is that we've raised seeds up here for a number of years, and we've had a lot of research go into the seeds. Uh, a lot of dedicated people, uh, private industry, universities, uh, uh, seed companies, and, and so on, are all involved in improving the sunflowers for our areas. But down south, they haven't had any research as such. The seed they're planting down there is, is northern variety sun seed. Now, genetically, the sunflower can be adapted for any growing area, but they haven't yet got to that point yet. So the seeds down there are not adaptable to their weather, nor to their soil conditions. Um, the article ended by saying that it took them down south about five or six years to learn how to raise soybeans. And they feel that they're at that point right now in the sunflowers. That in another five or six years, that's going to be a big area for sunflowers. Another thing is that you've got, the, you've got a lot of crushing facility down in, in Georgia. They're, uh, they crush primarily cotton and uh, soybeans, but they're also looking for other alternatives. This is going to be a, a big growing area and something we have to watch out for. I think also this year we're going to be expanding into uh, numerous states. Uh, working with Shelley, we've bought uh, sunflower seeds out of states that I wasn't even aware of that raised sunflowers. 
that's also going to change. I think that's going to grow. Our yields, in any time you're planting seeds in a new area, your yields are going to be lower uh, initially. Uh, the area is not uh, set up yet for that crop. The yields are going to increase. If we just plant the same acreage we had last year and under normal conditions get the crop planted on time, I think that we'll have a little better, a little better crop than we did. There's, there's so much demand for the seeds, and Al's going to get into that later, that someone has to be there to pick it up. I think that, you know, it's strange to me that this is the only country that discourages our farmers from planting. Every other country in the world is increasing, trying to increase production uh, every year, not always successfully. They don't have the capabilities, the conditions uh, that we have here, nor the incentives for that matter. Now, Russia figures on their sunflowers, the, their production is down uh, since the second half of the 1960s. Their crop was uh, averaging 6.4 million metric tons, but their five-year long-term goal has been 7.6 million metric tons. They're not going to reach that. And one of the primary reasons, I feel, is that they're still using the open pollinated seed, the peridovic, and they're more interested now, the peridovic, uh, from what they say, is, is better yielding in the oil, and that they're trying to in now concern a little bit more about their yields than they are about their oils. Um, <clears throat> I think that the only thing that sunflowers really have to compete against are the soybeans. Uh, in a year like this, when we have an overabundance of, of oil seeds, and initially the first part of the year, we are all very concerned when we start seeing all these big figures rolling off the presses on soybeans and sunflowers and uh, cotton. But the demand has been there. We're able to pick it up. We have a tremendous commitment by our industry. Uh, there's been an announcement of five or six, whatever it is, I've lost count, of uh, crushing plants going into North Dakota. Uh, the industry is dedicated. I no longer feel that sunflowers are a glory crop. I think that sunflowers are a major crop and that they're here to stay. They, the next five years, we're just going to be seeing it go on and on. When a company invests a multi-million dollars in, in a processing plant, uh, they've made a commitment. To, to stay there. They're not going to change. They're not going to turn around and crush wheat or whatever out in the middle of North Dakota. The sunflower future looks very good. Uh, that also we have a, we've been talking about a sunflower futures contract. Uh, I am on a committee with the discussing the sunflower futures contract and I'm not sure that we are quite ready for that yet. We have a lot of growth a lot of education left to be done in the sunflowers before we're ready to have a futures option. But I would much rather see a sunflower futures option in Minneapolis than I would in Chicago. I feel it be a little closer to home and it'd be a little closer to where uh, we really know the input that's going into it rather than Chicago. I want to thank you very much for having me. I hope that I'll get an opportunity to meet some of you later. Thank you. I'll turn it back to Al. <laughs> Marsha very enthusiastically presented you with the production figures for these past years. She described it distinctly that we've produced 3.3 million metric tons of sunflower seeds during 79 and 80. Now, it's not still standing out there in the field. What are we going to do with it? Obviously, there are two markets available for your sunflower seeds, and Shelly naturally strives to go to the premium market. Obvious two markets are the overseas market, the export market, or the domestic crush. To the export market, due to delays, two-month strike, etc., the million tons of exports that we anticipated this fall will be short by at least 200,000 tons and that Duluth Superior this year, along with the Gulf, will only move about 800,000 tons by the close of navigation. 
Well, where does this seed go? We still recognize that better than 60% of our crop is exported as whole seed. Where does it go? Our traditional markets still remain Holland and Germany, taking at least 75% of our production for our exports. As we've mentioned to you in the past, these people long ago recognized the ideal characteristics of sun oil for both cooking and for nutrition. And it shows in their per population usage of the sun oil. That market is going to continue. There are two new plants being built in that area. A uh, large U.S. company is building a plant in Amsterdam, and uh, Belgium Crusher is putting up a new plant in Belgium. So that market maintains itself and will always be there. France, as you know, the Balones were here and spoke to you two years ago. France is extremely interested in our sunflower seeds and will continue to import at least 100 to 150,000 ton a year. They, there's also a new plant that is going on stream this spring at Bordeaux. Uh, another one of the gentlemen that was visiting the farms in North Dakota, I guess about six years ago now, uh, Jean-Pierre Martinon with CNTA. We have the other traditional markets that are to a lesser degree, such as Portugal, takes their, their 200,000 ton a year. And this year we came up with a new sleeping giant in Italy. Italy will at least triple our imports of sunflower seeds. And you may ask yourself, why such a tremendous increase? Italy has had two problems. Number one, with their olive oil, the price of labor has gone so high that olive oil is completely non-competitive. Secondly, peanut oil, or groundnut oil as they call it overseas, has become extremely difficult to obtain. Most of the peanut oil is uh, produced in Africa, and due to the disruption in governments, the dis instability of the weather, peanut production is practically, it's, it's not, you cannot count on it if you're a consumer in Italy. So they've came to the U.S., and again, their usage of sun oil in the country has shows a remarkable increase. I reflected some statements on Africa here a second ago, and earlier this year in June I had the opportunity to visit Nigeria and discuss firsthand with one of the crushers. Nigeria is a country as six to eight years ago used to be one of the major exporters of peanut oil. We've got a vessel sitting in the harbor at Lagos right now discharging U.S. sunflower seeds. Well, quite a remarkable turnaround in only six years. As you know, our company goes along with the theory that the rapid growth is going to come in these developing countries. Nigeria right now is a petroleum exporter. I believe we import about 10 percent of our oil needs from them. They've got cash. They've got wealth. And how else do you maintain stability in governments if you don't feed your people? There are approximately, or there will be by 1980, 100 million people in Nigeria alone, half of our population. They're going to want food. They've got the crushing capacity, but they don't have the product locally. We, I'll discuss that a little bit later, but we have additional opportunities with that country. If we look at other developing countries, we can go right south to our neighbor, Mexico. Last year, they imported 280,000 metric tons of sunflower seeds and became the U.S.'s largest importer of seeds. I might say that uh, their government doesn't quite run as smoothly as ours. As you know, it comes, it, the purchases are made through a government agency called Conosupo. They got a couple things called logistics and transportation, so that when two of the vessels were loaded out of Duluth Superior in November, they sailed to Tampico, which is just south of Texas on the eastern gulf, this vessel sat there for nearly two months, 60 days in the harbor. Actually, it's a little bit warmer over in Tampico than it is in Blue Superior in November. And those vessels drew, between the two of them, $560,000 in demurrage, paid for by Conosupo. Must be nice when you got spare money from oil to just throw out like that. But anyway, we negotiated with Conosupo to buy those two back. One went to France and the other went to Portugal. But we did, were able to get them off to Murridge. This year, Mexico has not bought. 
They appear to be tendering in the next month for approximately 125,000 ton. And here again comes the logic of the government. During October, November, they bought soybeans. Now, January, February, they want to buy sunflower seeds. Seems to me have been more logical the other way around. And they would have saved money doing it. Okay, how does it, your sunflower seeds, how does a cons customer overseas find out about your sunflower seeds? Our company has an office in Rotterdam that contacts directly the crushers in Holland and Germany and France. We have a personal relationship in Nigeria. We have direct contacts into Conosupo in Mexico. In other areas of the world, we do with the exclusive agents or brokers, such as Portugal, Italy, etc. These people, it's an extremely efficient streamline flow of communications from Shelley we discuss with them two, three times a day what his marketing ideas are. We relay these overseas via telex. They're seven hours ahead of us. In the morning when we come into work, we've got the answers already. Our company personally has, under time charter, four vessels that are fitted for Duluth Superior. We recognized the tightness that was going to come into the lakes, the large flow of material in a short time, and the critical necessity for having timing of ships. One of those, as I mentioned, is sitting in Lagos right now. The other one is, one is sailing to Italy, and two are heading for the main continent. I'm not afraid of the export market for, sun, for su sunflower seeds. It's going to maintain itself. I would venture to say that we would not have any carryover, which I'll discuss later, at the end of this year, if we could arrange somehow to have Duluth Superior open year-round. Right now, however, if you take sunflower seeds and run them down to the Gulf, you become completely non-competitive with other oil seeds around the world, such as soybeans, rapeseed, and other products that can be shipped direct out of Canada. The other market, as I touched on basically or quickly, is the domestic market. I estimate to go back one step is that out of that 3.3 million tons of production, we'll get out 1.8 total for the year of exports, which leaves us in a balance of 1.5 million tons, of which if we double the crop this year, I feel we'll logically double the crush and run it up to 700,000 ton. That leaves us with 800,000 ton of sunflower seeds looking for a home in 1979 and 80, almost the crop size two years ago looking for carryover. Now you can understand the reasons why there's five to six crushing plants on the boards in North Dakota and northern Minnesota. The crop is here. It's here to stay. The demand for sun oil in this country, I still call it a sleeping giant. We've got the power of advertising. We know in this room the quality of the oil, and all we need is shelf space on, in the grocery store because the demand is here. So either one of these two factors, Duluth Superior open year-round, or in the additional crushing plants that are on the boards today, you'd have zero, car zero carryover at the end of the year. Uh, we can see the one problem being diminished within the year. It's been announced that one of the crushing plants will be in operation and likely within two to three years, the other three or four that are on the boards will be in operation. So our domestic market is being developed. Now, to back up one other step again and going back to exports, how do we continue to be competitive overseas and increase the demand for our exports? We, I feel within six months, sunflower seeds will be going to Japan also. We've had extreme interest, We've had meetings with uh, oil seed traders for Mitsubishi, and it appears that Japan is on the verge to import sunflower seeds again, which we all know they did one of the first importers of our sunflower seeds. In summary, if we look, I might, if we look in. At one point that I'd like to leave with you today, 
and Marcia touched on it lightly, is that the U.S. sunflower seed crop is not a specialty item anymore. It's a major crop. And it's at the point now where we must recognize that and treat it as a major crop. The customers overseas have already recognized it. We're not at the place, we're not at the point anymore where we sell two, three thousand ton at a time. We're at orders now are for 30,000, 40,000, or 125,000 ton. But just let me quickly convert that so that you can get it into meat and potatoes. We've I expect Nigeria to buy two more cargoes of sunflower seeds in January and February. That's 30,000 ton converted to acres, 55,000 acres of sunflower seeds. We've got, as I mentioned before, reports that Mexico is going to be tendering for 125,000 tons. That's 200,000 acres of sunflower seeds. This is for the 7980 crop year. But there's one other unique order which we had three months ago that came from a responsible Italian crusher, one that we've done business with, wanted 50,000 ton of November 1980 seeds. And you may ask yourself, why is a crusher, when he's looking at an anticipated carryover of the U.S. crop, no change in production for next year, why is he interested in buying 40,000 ton of November 1980 crops? It's because of two reasons. The commitment he, that he has to his grocery stores, to his consumers, to whomever he has he's set, that he's selling that sun oil to. And also, currencies play a major role in world trading at this stage. As we've all heard that gold has gone up to $400 an ounce, a dollar is up, down, everywhere, depending upon the mood of the president or somebody. And the relationships between the Italian lira, the Deutsche Mark, the Dutch Gilder, have all reflected and allow these people to lock in their crush margin, hedge their currencies, and look and want to buy. So it leaves us quite a challenge. The buyer overseas recognizes as major crop, and also the grain companies in this United States. There is not a major grain company today that does not have an active sun seed commodity department. They're adding staff, they're adding logistics. They're converted in their minds that it is going to be a major crop. And I feel if there's a challenge that we have as the relationships that we've developed here the buyers that we have overseas, as reflected in this order for 50,000 ton, converts to 90,000 acres. 90,000 acres of your production possibly could have been already sold to one buyer. Just think for a second how much additional clout that gives you with that crusher. Where is he going to come to the next time he wants an order for 50,000 ton? It's going to come right back. If there's a challenge I'd like to leave with all of us today, it's that we work together and continue this relationship, continue the information flow that we have back and forth so that in 1980-81 we can have your production much higher than Shelley had ever anticipated. Okay. Thank you. You see, uh, the more Al stays around us, the more he starts talking like us. And he's throwing out better challenges than I can. And that's what we want. Uh, and that brings us to the next part of our program. You know, and we keep talking about it, we developed a very unique relationship with I.S. Joseph over these years. We're all aware of it. Maybe some of the new people aren't. But it is unique in the industry, extremely unique. And it was because of this uniqueness uh, two and a half years ago. Yes, sir. Uh, we have a question and answer period at the end. If we could go on now, you'll be allowed to write it down, and we'll see it's answered, okay? Going on about two, two and a half years ago, we recognized that 
uh, and you can tell by this world market report that both Al and Marsha were involved, Marsha were involved in, uh, that it's going to go to the domestic scene uh, very rapidly also. And knowing that, uh, we started, uh, as I say, some time ago, uh, working on a plan to develop our own domestic crush. And last year, of course, we unveiled the idea. It was only an idea, and we couldn't talk about it very much, and you remember why. It was because of SEC. Well, what's happened in this last year? Uh, where, where do we stand? I think that's a question that's probably on everyone's mind. It's a very good question. Through many conferences and hours of planning and uh, discussion, the plan has developed as follows, and I'll explain why as I go along. We now have as a partner in this operation a company known as Sesutro, who you'll find out about in just a few moments. And one of the goals of the meeting today is to get acquainted with another company that we hope to develop a relationship with, a foreign company, if you will. We hope to develop a relationship exactly like that with I.S. Joseph. And by having three of us in this, and we each have our own qualities, us as procurement or providing the sunflowers, I.S. Joseph with their outlets, and Sesutro with their crush knowledge, and I'm not going to take away from your speech, Jonathan, but uh, with those abilities, those three put together, there will never be a combination like it anyplace else that we know, because we doubt that Cargill or uh, Continental or ADM or whoever it may be uh, will want to develop a relationship as close as we have where we share our personal information back and forth. And that's the agreement before we're done that any project we enter into that our books are open to each other for that part of the project. And it's worked very successfully, and you know that from our own program here. As we went through and developed this program this last year, it became more and more evident that we as members could not participate in this project in a financial way. And the reason for it is, is SEC. You see, we got down to where we had SEC lawyers, that, which incidentally are very expensive, uh, which told us that there was no way that I could ever talk to you people about a crush plant. It also meant that Braun of Gron, who was going to talk about it some too, he was enthused with the uh, idea, couldn't come out and help promote it either. It meant that also that uh, county leaders in the counties couldn't talk about it. Well, you say, why? Well, if we all remember, back several years ago, we signed a consent decree to finalize our solution with SEC. You all remember that. And that uh, consent decree says that we will not enter into or solicit or sell securities without prior approval of SEC. And there's no way that this time that we can make that qualification work and meet a time frame that is so extremely necessary for us to be viable in this. In other words, we anticipate that permission taking anywhere from six months to possibly a year and being extremely expensive. We anticipate the minimum cost just to get that permission would be sixty to seventy thousand dollars in legal filing and uh, renderings to get permission from SEC because time is of the essence. Now, why is time so important? One is to be ready for the production. Two is the fact that every day, or better yet, every month that we delay this project, and with interest rates, and this was at 10% incidentally, at 10% interest rates, our costs were going up $250,000 a month, just on interest alone. So we have to get the project off of dead center. So we had a long meeting here some time ago and came to the conclusion that we, as NFO members, would have to withdraw f from the financial support of this project, but that it never changed the real thing that we're really after. We were trying to give you the whole package, and that is the marketing ability that this plant would give us where we have this relationship with these companies. It would mean that we would have companies working with us that know and trust us, and that we would be in on the ground floor even though we didn't have a financial implication into the company. It's unfortunate, and I hate to have to announce that we can't be in it financially. But I am happy to report that it doesn't change anything else, that our marketing ability and our programs that we envision will be just as strong 
and perhaps a little stronger because now we don't have to worry about SEC in any way, shape, or form. And this has concerned our lawyers um, uh, considerably on that. Knowing that, say Sutro wanted to come to the meeting today uh, to get acquainted so that you would know who are they and learn about them. And you'll be told that in just a few moments. To introduce the gentleman from Say Sutro, which incidentally is an Argentine company, I have with us this afternoon, or we have with us, a very distinguished gentleman from I.S. Joseph Company. And I say he's distinguished because he carries a lot of weight around up there because he has uh, and carries a checkbook part of the time. Please turn the tape over to side number two.